Thank you, Pastor. Well, we've been to church, haven't we? That's good. God's Word will stand. That, that ought to be our anthem. God's Word will stand when all else has failed. Well, open your clippy book and get over, see if you can find Monday. The Bible and walking worthy of him in our study. We've sort of let the Bible <clears throat> drop a spot or two from where it ought to be. And we, we need to work on that. When Pastor Andrew called me about this and we were discussing the salary and the financial benefits of coming where I could decide whether I wanted to be here or not, he, he, he was telling me what he wanted to do, what he felt like the Lord was leading him to do in the conference and the nature of it. And uh, I, I said, well, well uh, Pastor, that sounds like one of the old Keswick conferences. I forgot about his age. He said, what's that? <laughs> uh, actually, they started in 1875 in the little town of uh, uh, Keswick in uh, England. 142 years ago, they're still going on every year. They have a Keswick, they call it a convention. It's a wordplay thing. They do five days every day from the Bible, all the different preachers every day. On Monday, they preach on the same subject. Tuesday, the next subject, all the preachers preach on it all pushing toward one aim. Uh, their purpose is in print. It's, quote, to provide ministry from God's word, which will lead people into the fullness of spiritual blessing. Somebody said, well, now, you, you don't want to get deeper life. Well, I don't think we're in any danger of that. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, we, we'd have to go a long way to get this crowd deeper life, that's for sure. But if you wanted to know your Bible better, it's, it's not an expensive thing. It's really not. You know, you could stop by the bookstore back there, and uh, they have the old Schofield Bible, King James. They're not expensive. It'd be the most expensive thing you needed, but they're not expensive. And uh, they have some. They can order more. Uh, you probably would need in the start a Bible reading guide of some kind. There are thousands of them out there to guide you through reading the Bible through at least once a year. But don't let that become a ritual. Don't do that because it's time to read the Bible to get through reading the Bible in a year. But it's a good thing to start with. And so you can get those or some on my table absolutely free. About the only thing on there that's free. But, uh, you know, I get nervous when the pastor starts saying, go by the table and pick up something on the way out. <laughs> Please don't. That, that's not nice. If you like me, you might need a prayer book. Now, I'm not talking about one that's got the prayers written down in it, but something expensive like this. It doesn't have a thing in it, you have to write in it. But you keep up with your, what you're praying about. You know, someone says, well, I can remember it. Well, I can't. And so there's a page where I pray for personal things, ministry. And uh, there's a page where I pray for sick people. And uh, there's a place where I pray for lost people. I have six pages with, it just happened to work out this way, with uh, uh, six days worth. And there are 40 preachers each day that I pray for. 
And then there are 27 or 28 that I pray for every day. They're the ones that really need it. I pray for the preacher and Brother Andrew every day, you know, and the staff here and some others. And I pray for some special needs. And I can't remember it. And I, you know, I just, I don't pray for all of them one day at one time. I pray for enough that I can get through. And uh, you, you can just keep up with it that way. And uh, that, that's a Walmart special. And, and maybe if you're going to really get into it, you ought to get you a, a high dollar book like this. And, and that way when you're reading your Bible and you're studying and God suddenly gives you something, put it down. I, I love what George Mueller said. Uh, he said, I, I quit struggling to pray when I decided I'd pray what the Bible said. And he said, I would read my Bible. And when I came to a promise in it, I'd put my finger on it. And he said, then I'd claim the promise in prayer. He said, I found it easy to pray then. And uh, so you get your books. And now, don't steal one out of the church, but you ought to have a hymn book. Somebody said, what church did that come out? None of your business. <laughs> but you really, you'd be really surprised because you don't pay any attention when you sing those hymns. You, you couldn't give me the words on, you don't pay any attention. But if you'll sit down with them sometime when you're burdened, just kind of look through them, you know. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. There's stuff in there. The Bible, walking worthy of him in our study. You got your book open. We're on cue up there. You can read it. Let's, let's talk for a moment. Our, our, our text verse, 1 Thessalonians 2.12, that you should, would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. You know, it's remarkable to me that the non-Christian can tell instantly whether we who claim to be Christians have the goods or not. They've got some kind of inner working. I mean, they know, they know when we're faking it and when we're, they, they pick up on whether or not Jesus Christ is the driving force of our life and they pick up on whether or not the Bible is our rule of faith and practice. And it doesn't take them very long to do it. And then we claim to be walking worthy and they say no. And they have words they call us and I won't go there with those. But that's, the, so, someone said, I don't know why more folks don't come to church because of us. They know too many of us, and we need to change that desperately, let's see. It, it's obvious in our churches when you look around. There are some folks who have it, and it's obvious, and there are some folks in church who don't have it, and it's obvious. You, just, you can't get away from it. It's just the deal. Now, there are two statements in the Old Testament we will look at tonight for a moment about two men that point out to us the difference between walking worthy in him and what is not. The first example you have there, right in the name, Samson. Samson, the first example, Samson. Judges 16, 20. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself. Now, if you... Uh, later looking through your Bible and you mark your Bible, you ought to mark these next words. And he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. What a tragedy. So everything still looked the same. Everything seemed the same. He sounded the same. But he's not walking worthy of God anymore. Things have definitely changed. Now, what, what causes a change like that? What, what would bring us uh, to, to one day walk out of church and not even know that his presence, his fellowship, now you're not going to lose your relationship. 
but his presence, his fellowship, his power had been withdrawn and we were walking unworthy. What causes a change like that? I think when you think about it, there's some obvious things. Many times, the good things in life are the cause of it. Under point A, you're writing in your book, being raised in a Christian home, big problem. I wish everybody was, but if you're not careful, that great advantage causes us the most problems. See, we have folks who never lived in anything but a Christian home. They can't remember not believing. They, 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 they always believe something but they think they're a believing believer. You know, it's, 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 it's very strange, you know. But somewhere along the line, as they grew up in that Christian home, never can remember not remembering, they've never come to that personal saving relationship when they recognized they were a sinner, recognized that they couldn't save themselves, recognized that salvation came through Christ and Christ alone. They never came to that, but we carry them on. Somehow they think they just kind of ooze into Christianity. Well, I've been in church all my life. Wonderful. I was born in a Christian home. Wonderful. You've heard that great theological statement, you know. Uh, you cats born in a garage don't make an automobile out of him. I should have put that on the screen. You're not getting it. But. <laughs> I asked Andrew too, and he wouldn't put it on there. He said, that's not good, you know, so. But I wanted to do it anyway. But uh, they, 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 they're just not walking worthy. How many times have we heard this? Well, they graduated from high school, been in our church all their life, went to that secular Christian college and lost their faith. No, they never had faith. No, they never had faith. They just got to college and realized it. Hmm? And we need to do something about that. And we need to understand that the Christian home, being born in the Christian home, not the answer to it. The book's got to come in midstream all the way. And we have to understand that. And uh, so they in church, but just unborn. Uh, they wist not. They wist not. And then the second thing that comes along, we, I know this sounds light, but it's, it's really on my heart. We, we sing songs and hymns that are far from our spiritual reality. You, you say, what are you talking about? Well, I, I thought that was pretty simple English. What I'm talking about is we sing every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Really? Really? You don't look like it. Hmm? Oh, why? We, we, we really crank it up on, I'm so happy and here's the reason why. Jesus took my burdens all away. Yeah? Well, now both these songs are wonderful, but the question is, are they true in our experience? You know, we, we sing songs like that and just, just get going so good. <laughs> we, sing, we sing some dandies every once in a while. We sing, take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee. And we have no intention of that ever playing out in our life. Hmm? See, we... We, we sing stuff and it gets in our mind that that's where we are. We ain't there. Amen. We need to understand it. See, obedience is the key indicator of whether we're walking worthy of him or not. Not, not, not if we sing in some quivering voice, Jesus, I love thee. No, obedience. 1 John 2, 3 should be up there. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That'll pretty much tell it, won't it? Yeah. I mean, and instead of singing, oh, how I love Jesus, say it. 
And then when you obey it, you can sing it in reality. All to Jesus, I surrender. And then you can't get a dime out of a dollar for a tithe. It's good, isn't it? I'm glad you're here on, I'm glad you're here on Monday night. I really am, you know. But we need to understand it, you see. Our walk says much more than our talk. So we have the example of Samson, a man filled with the power of God who let things come into his life that turned him and he wished not that he wasn't walking worthy with the Lord. But we have a second example and that's Moses. If you're writing in your book now, Moses. Got to flip over here on that next page. Exodus 34, 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hands, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. He wist not that the skin of his face shone. It's an interesting story. Samson wished not that the Lord had departed from him. Uh, Moses wished not that his face was shining with the glory of God. Moses came down off the mountain. He didn't have to hold up a sign and said, I've been with God. No, no, it was apparent. That's the reason the world can tell. They still can tell. You know, he had met with God in a special way and there is no other solution to the problem of us not walking worthy in our study but the living in the presence of God on a day-to-day -day basis personally. We need to make time. We need to make time to meet with him early and start his day under his guidance from his word. We need to make time. Just has to be done. In, in John 4, 23, under that second example, this one's a little bit tough, but it's there. Jesus said, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Watch now. For the Father seeketh such the Father seeketh such to worship him. I don't want you to misunderstand this and, and it's just because if there's anybody in here that doesn't deserve it, it would be me. But God wants to meet with me. That's what the book said. God wants to meet with me. That's a good enough reason for me. I don't need any other reason to make time than to know that God wants to meet with me. Amen. If you make anything else out of that verse, you're a heretic. <laughs> Has that truth ever gripped your heart that God longs to meet with you? When you get up in the morning, you get busy about everything. You've got to hurry and you've got to get to work and you ladies have got to make those biscuits by hand and make that gravy by hand and cook those eggs and squeeze the orange juice by hand and get your husband's clothes put out and the country ham cooked. You've got all that to do like you do every morning. But God wants to meet with you. You've got to make time. You, 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 you young people that have to go to school, such a hard life. Make some time for God. Early. Make it early in the morning. See, prayer time and Bible time is essential to walking worthy. Someone said, well, when I wake up, I don't feel like it. Well, Lord, when I wake up, I don't feel like nothing. Maybe mashed potatoes cold. <laughs> I mean... I've always thought, you know, the wonder of God, it seemed like he could let us start a day better than waking up. Must be some way to start them better than that, you know? It's not, that's just not right to, to have to start the day like that. And you get up, you say, well, I don't, I don't really feel like running to my quiet place and praying and reading the Bible. It's not about your feelings. 
It's a discipline. I, uh, Sean and I uh, had breakfast the other morning. I thought he'd pay, he didn't. <laughs> and so uh, we, we sat down and then when I got my food, I reached in my pocket and got that handful of pills I take every morning. And I, I thought he'd make fun of it, but he knew better. And I said, well, you can look at this and see what's ahead for you, Sean. <laughs> I hate taking those things but I take them, I take them faithfully. I, for years now, I've had to, I have never missed a dose. Now, I've spent a lot of time crawling around on the floor trying to pick up the ones I dropped, but I have never missed a dose. You know why? It's essential to my well-being. It's essential to my life. And yet we treat the most important thing, Amen. more important than this life could ever be. Amen. We take it or leave it. Amen. When we understand that God desires to meet with us, and we, when we understand that our life is never gonna be what it ought to be till we meet with him, you know, it, it, and it comforts me to know, I was talking about George Mueller a while ago, and he's known as a praying man. He's, he lived in the 1800s, died in 1895. Prayed in over $7 million in that year's money, in the, in the 1800s, for, for feeding orphans. He did not believe in asking people for money. He said, I'll ask God. And so he got the reputation of, of being a great man of prayer and somebody was talking to him about it. He said, said you, you must, you, it must be the joy of your life to pray. And he said, well, sometimes I don't want to pray. And they said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I figured out if there were times when I got up and I didn't want to pray, I had to do something. And he said, so I just think myself happy before the Lord, and then I go pray. And so maybe that would be good for us to get up and just take a minute or two to think about, now where would I be if not for God? Amen. Just where would I be right this minute if not for God? And concentrate on that, and before long, your soul will get happy, and you can go pray, and you can go read your Bible. Here's, here's a question for you. Uh, I don't know exactly how they're coming up, but here's a question for you. When was the last time you received something directly from the Word of God through the Holy Spirit without any human help? When was it? You say, well, it's been a long time. And the question may be, well, how do I get something out of the Word? How do I get something out of the Word? Well, if you, if you won't let it get legalistic and binding, there are several ways. I, I noticed the pastor had an article in the bulletin Sunday morning on, on helps in doing that. But here's some that uh, I've gathered up over the years from various sources. And if you'll do this, then we'll talk about it. If you will get along with God, and you will prayerfully ask him to speak to you through the word, ask him to. And if you'll read a passage of scripture or more, and then ask these questions that are there on your sheet, you'll find that God will give you truth directly from the word. Number one on your sheet that has the place for you to write in it. Ask yourself this question, is there an example for me to follow in what I have read. Why do we spend time reading it if we're not going to obey it? Why waste, don't waste the time. Number two, is there a sin for me to avoid? Number three, is there a command that I should obey? You know, 
We meet people all the time. They're all bent out of shape over the will of God for their life. What's the will of God for my life? What should God, the truth of the matter is, a good deal of the will of God for your life is already spelled out in the Bible. You just read over it and won't pay any attention to it. Now you're gonna make me do my own amen and then I'm already running over time. <laughs> Andrew's pushing that button on the yellow light back there now. <laughs> Is there a commandment I should obey? See, the Word of God is explicit as to what He would want us to do yes. and what He'd want us to be. We're going to talk about that tomorrow night if they let me come back. Yes. On the Bible and the will of God for your life. Number four, is there a promise for me to claim? See, let's just go ahead and get where it's at. Many of us, if not most of us, live in spiritual poverty because we're not willing to claim the promises that God made to his children Amen. now in this time. Amen. And it ought not be like that. You know, uh, we're either not aware or we just don't understand or we don't lay hold on and we refuse to enjoy and live by faith in the life of God's promises and our life could be enriched and empowered. So is there a promise for me to claim? Number five, <clears throat> what does this passage teach me about Jesus Christ, our God the Father? See, the, the Christian life is a, it's a dynamic that just keeps expanding if you'll allow it to, you see. And concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, you get to know more and more and more about him as you study the Word of God. You don't get it all in one shot. It's like getting married. See, when you got married, if you're as smart as I am, you thought you knew all about that person. <laughs> Hello. Uh, eight years later, ask me. Hmm. You, you know what I'd say? And she would too. She got the worst end of the deal, but I wouldn't tell her. I'd have to say, you know, I, I didn't really know her at all. I knew what she wanted me to know about her. Huh? Well, that's, when, when I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I didn't know him. I knew what he did, and I knew about him, but I didn't know much about him. I knew enough to know he loved me. That's the reason I married one day, I knew enough to know that. But I know him better today. But everything I know about him came out of the book. Yeah. See, by the way, that's one reason you're an idiot if you marry a, somebody that's not a child of God. You know, marriage is a lifetime of getting acquainted. That's what's so wonderful about it. That's also true of Christianity. It's a lifetime of getting acquainted with God and Jesus Christ. And that's what's so wonderful about it. And we need to understand that. Number six, is there some difficulty here I should get help with? Some difficulty. And we talked about that last night. And, and if so, be sure you get help from a trustworthy source. One of our folks walking in tonight uh, showed me a commentary and said, what do you think about it? I said, not much. Got John MacArthur's name on it. What do you think about it? Got some other names on it. You have to be real careful where you get your spiritual help. And, and there's a lot of good spiritual help on the internet, but you better be sure you know where it's at. Yes. Don't go fishing. No. Get some help. Know where to go. You know, there, there are libraries of good stuff on there. You know, we used to have to spend blue coodles of money buying books. You, you, you can find it all. And, and it's very helpful, but you need to know where it's at. Number seven, is there a prayer from this passage which could become mine. 
See, my prayers tend to get like a broken record if I'm not real careful. Lord, bless me and the church and everybody else. Amen. That's not going to get it. Prayer is a vital aspect of walking worthy in our study, and we need to draw our prayer life from the Word of God, and we can do that. I read or heard, I think I heard years ago, a preacher was preaching on prayer. And he said, I find a strange paradox in my life. Are, are you listening? I find that the thing that I know that gives me the deepest joy and the deepest pleasure, namely to be in the presence of God unheard, is the thing it seems that I want least to do and I must fight continually the battle of the threshold. Short version, that which I enjoy, that which blesses me most, I don't do. That's being with God, unhurried, unrushed, unpushed by the clock. Walking worthy comes down to that very thing. See, when we say we love the Lord, that's, that's not the same. It's not to be the same meaning as when we say we love our wife. It's not that emotional thing that we're talking about. How did the Lord define love? John 14, 21. There it is. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. That's God's definition of love. No, we think it's some queasy feeling or some chill running up and down our backbone. But it's not. So meet with him in the morning. Make time. And if you have a problem getting started, if you don't have a hymn book, you can't remember one, pull it up on the internet. Get, you know, follow some, follow some of the great men of old. You used to see their sermons and they'd have those verses of Psalms all through them. There'd be a verse here and a verse there. It's kind of following their footsteps. And you don't really want to pray and you don't really feel built spiritual. Now I can't sing a lick. If you've ever sat by me, you know it. But in my mind, I have the most perfect voice. I can sing all four parts at one time. <laughs> right on key. And when it comes to those high parts, you ought to hear what I hear when I'm singing them. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make a sound, but it comes out in my mind that way. And so sometimes when I don't feel real good, I sing to myself, so precious is Jesus, my Savior and King. I think about that. His praises all the day long with rapture I sing. To him in my weakness for strength I can claim for he is so precious to me. Somebody said, how do you know? Because the Bible tells me so.